Let's think about the Teachers College in our hearts and minds, which touches every corner of the world every day. What is Teachers College? It's the epicenter of education, health, and psychology. It is nearly every school system, community health program, and multicultural counseling program in the United States and beyond. But it's also a coffee cart on West 120th Street. It's a speeding number one train. It's the early morning sunlight over Morningside Park. And at this uncertain moment, it's a way of being in a complicated world. Teachers College is the stuff that dreams are made of. It is a canvas on which each successive generation paints its murals. It's a universal library where we add our collective masterworks. It's a mixing board to lay down our tracks alongside the greats. Teachers College is Harlem, where we work with educators learning the neighborhood's proud history and legacy of resourcefulness and indomitable will. TC is America's community colleges, which are a gateway for underserved populations. And TC is also indelibly New York City, where we are helping schools transition to online education, bringing critically needed medical equipment to major hospitals and providing psychological services, even as the current crisis touches us personally. But Teachers College is also Bangladesh and Lebanon, TC is Ecuador and Peru. It's Ghana and Cambodia and Bolivia. It's China and it's Europe. On almost every continent, we find TC, creating and improving schools, bringing visits to young people worldwide through hip hop pedagogy, giving displaced people new hope, working with indigenous populations to preserve their own languages, helping children with cleft palate reclaim their lives, empowering children with autism to utter their first words. All of these people, states, and countries are Teachers College, as are all the places our students call home. It's everywhere that our graduates are shaping a healthier, better educated, more equitable, and more joyful world. TC is in our hearts and minds, as well as in every corner of the world. Hello, I'm Dr. Barbara Bashaw, Executive Director and Arnhold Professor of Practice in Dance Education. It's my pleasure to introduce our next guest speaker, Dr. Ojea Cruz Banks, and her talk, Revisioning Dance Through Black African Indigenous Perspectives. Dr. Cruz Banks is an Associate Professor of Dance at Denison University. Her research is inspired by her African and Pacific Islander American lineages from Guam to Alabama, Kentucky, and Louisiana. For over a decade, she worked as a senior lecturer at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Her research and teaching focus on Black, African, and Indigenous Pacific dance education, choreography, and performance. Her choreographies and publications include West African Dance, Guinea and Senegal, and Pacific Island Dance as a spiritual well-being source and a vital praxis for decolonization. Welcome, Dr. Cruz Banks. Bagadi Badasewa Bagadi Badasewa Bagadi Badasewa Kifinda Heala Yope Kifinda That song was gifted to me by Mustafa Bangora, a renowned dancer, choreographer, teacher from Guinea, West Africa. He has been a primary teacher for me for many years. The chant pays memorial to his father's village named Kifinda in the Boke region. Located in the tropical swamps of the Atlantic, where he spent time as a child, 
the place made an impression upon him as a dance artist. I have visited and danced on the white sands of Kifinda a few times. It's a very humbling place. The song was composed to express Bangora's love for his village and call forth the rhythm and dance, Sorsane. Sorsane is a dance that originated from Bagaland. The dance is popular and one of the first Baga rhythms to migrate to the United States or Turtle Island. The song and dance carries Bangora's autobiography and his affection for his homeland. It is an honor to be invited to speak with the Arnold Institute of Dance Education, Research Policy and Leadership to celebrate the future of the new PhD program dedicated to dance education. This is really awesome. The title of my talk is Re-envisioning Re Dance Education Through African Diaspora, African and Indigenous Dance Perspectives. What I wanna share are a few brief dance ethnographic stories from the Pacific continent West Africa to the United States. I draw from my experience as a dance artist, a dance educator, an ethnographer. A big impetus for my work is about recovering ancestral funds of knowledge that is related to my identity as a black African Pacifica woman. For almost three years now, I'm I've just returned um, to the United States. I lived in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand for over a decade where I worked at the University of Otago. When I was there, I had the opportunity to dive into um, Maori perspectives of dance. Being based in the Pacific equipped me with a wider global lens for thinking about the pedagogical significance of dance. For quite some time now, I've been interested in what I call critical post-colonial dance recovery. In other words, how dance, chant, music invoke critical worldviews, knowledge, transmission, and spiritual capital that remedy cultural oppression. The examples that I share with you derive from investigations in and with indigenous and diasporic communities and through my own experiences as a dancer. These arenas advanced my thinking about dance teaching, training, and dance artistry. It's important to remember that how we frame dance as dance educators is never culturally neutral. It's also important to remember that dance education has a long tradition that dates well back before mass schooling far into antiquity. To start, I thought it would be helpful to briefly explore the question, what is dance? What is the purpose of dance? I want to answer the question based off of snapshots from Aotearoa, New Zealand, Guahan or Guam, the US and West Africa. What I've found in my research is that black African indigenous communities, for them, dance is not compartmentalized. It is often, often a synchronization of music, chant, poetry, in order to create a total sensory embodiment of literacies and subjectivities. Movement is a repository of language, of heritage, of environmental knowledge, this explains why dance breeds cultural perception, ethical values, and reinforces ancestral knowledge and ways of perceiving and being. Dance and chant are pedagogically bound. For instance, chant is the mouthpiece and dance is the personification of indigenous cosmologies. Dance can submerge a group in worldview in sonic frequencies that nurture indigenous intellectual intellect, intellects and sensory acuity. 
My research reveals that dance scaffolds language acquisition, oral history, spiritual capital and well-being, psychological recalibration. In other words, it, straighten, it strengthens one identity in culturally relevant ways. It also brings about awareness of ancestral geographies, the relationship between human, land, and water relationships. Now I want to share brief ethnographic summaries of my research from the Pacific to West Africa. I hope that these distinct cultural standpoints inherently enrich our understanding of the purpose of dance education, the terminology, the format, the approaches to training, plus notions of technique in dance making. Let's start in the South Pacific, in Aotearoa. Whakataka tahau ki te uru, whakataka tahau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai. It was the night when the gods sang the world into being, the world of light to the world of music. These are the words of the great, late music composer, Hirini Melbourne. The proverb signals the music that music gave birth to indigenous Maori worlds, and this is echoed across the Pacific. Chant is the foundation of dance. It is exemplified by kapahaka, kapahaka meaning group dance in New Zealand. Perhaps you've seen haka performed um, in the international all black New Zealand rugby team or on social media, or if you've lucky, you've witnessed it live. Kapahaka or group dance is a primary teaching methodology for kaupapa Māori or Māori language immersion schools. There are kapahaka competitions and other Pacific Island dance festivals held annually in the country. And kapahaka is widely taught in New Zealand public schools and also at a university level. Haka can happen spontaneously at funerals, weddings, farewells, graduations. It involves the synchronicity of chant, moves, body percussion, and creates an embodied understanding of the words, the kupu, the words. Dance or haka is described as a database of language and mythology. Hence, it is considered an effective methodology for rehabilitating language loss as a consequence of colonialism. It is a form of political intervention or protest. Māori use it to reclaim colonial space and for them to, to claim their status as the guardians of the land and music, I'm sorry, the guardian of the land and culture. Haka is performed at university student rallies and performed as part of the recent Black Lives Matter Solidarity March that happened in Wellington. Haka has been called embodied sovereignty by influential Maori scholar Hokofitu. He describes this as a feeling or activation of indigenous culture. Haka actions what I call somatic decolonization. It's a sensorial grab attention. It has the power to hit the pause button on colonial noise and haka performances often will interrupt colonial institution systems, structures, and bureaucracies. Nathan Matthews says, when, you, when haka is performed well, you feel the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Haka instantly transports you into a Maori world. Haka is always um, uh, included with a motif that's called the witty. This is a fundamental Māori movement. Witi is likened to a hand shimmy. It's described as the embodiment of sunlight shimmering on the ocean or the rustling of leaves. It's also physiologically helpful for loosening up the body so that one can channel their mana or their spiritual inheritance. The ultimate goal of haka is to embody ancestral power. In New Zealand, I had the opportunity to collaborate with indigenous Maori dancers who were researching pre-colonial concepts of dance. 
they invited a selection of mostly Maori dance artists to engage in creative workshops, and I was very honored to be in the mix. The goal of the event was to revive the tradition called Fare Tapere, which is roughly translated to House of the Arts or Performing Arts. The project lasted about five years, and members of the research team have used this content to teach dance in public schools all the way to a university level. This project also informed the dance content that I delivered at the University of Otago when I worked there. A significant paradigm of dance that they investigated was called fakawa, which is the ultimate quality of dance. Fakawa means to become. In the movement workshops with the team, we spent time observing the ocean, imitating it, meditating, listening to the water soundscapes. We even danced in the water. I discovered that to dance for Maori is to absorb, to witness the ocean and land, to become it, to take it into your body, to express the creativity of the natural world. Charles Royal, who guided the Fare Tapere research said, to dance is to become sensorial alive. He said the work is about re-indigenizing somatic connection to ancestral land that has been interrupted by colonialism. Now we're gonna to move to the North Pacific, Guahan or Guam. Guam is one of my homelands. Guahan is a member of an archipelago in the Northwestern Pacific, where my mothers of many generations were born. There are commonalities between how dance is conceptualized here and in Aotearoa. For example, indigenous Chamorro utilize dance for promoting language revitalization. One such group is called Ifana Layan, which means a place to chant. This group was established by a brother-sister team, Leonard and Juanita Iriarti. The group is made up of teenagers to young adults. The founders describe the group as an ongoing oral history program that seeks to secure traditional depository for terminology and language to the creation of chants and dance. Ifana Lyon's distinct approach to chant is to use the older Chamorro language that is not commonly spoken anymore. The dominant language today is laden with Spanish, and this is due to 400 years of Spanish colonialism. Ifana Lyon's chants are rhythm poems, melodic soundboards of legends and folklore. Ifan sees chant as an essential vessel of indigenous language. Here's a short portrait of Ifana Lyon at a performance at the University of Guam in 2012. As the dance choir entered the stage, they were wearing black and orange sarongs adorned with crowns made of yellow flowers on their foreheads. They sang the song, Ayacho et Ate, the magic stone. The room reverberated as the collective voices sang about the legendary sea voyager. The men, the men paced solemnly with paddles in their hands as they sang. And then the entire assembly began to undulate gently. With their right hand, the men extended their paddles and their hips moved like turbulent wind blowing through the water. In contrast, the women's arms floated and hands flexed away from their hips while their whole body swayed. Their feet shifted carefully as calm water. The movements were oceanic. Now I wanna to turn to Turtle Island or the US and then to research that I did in West Africa. So we're moving into the African diaspora context. I wanna share with you work that I did on West African dance and its role um, in the spiritual well-being of African-American people. The research collaborates and focuses on the journey of Dr. Jeanette Jackson and, express, and her experiences that led her to become a West African dance educator. Her story illustrates how African-American um, 
dance or African dance confronts the ongoing effects of racism in the United States and reestablishes experiences vital to the cultural health, the spiritual well-being of African descended Americans. Jackson has dedicated her life to teaching West African dance through her nonprofit organization called Africa International, which is based in Los Angeles. She said to me in an interview, why should we be enslaved to bad thoughts, bad education, poverty, and a lack of opportunity? We are created to be great. Our babies will see themselves as great. It all starts with the drum. Jackson and I both testified to the fact that djembe music, a hand drum originally from Mali, West Africa, has been a lifeline for us. Gabriel Fara Tono, a renowned djembe fola and dancer from Guinea, said the musician's job is to give light to the dancer. Tono explained that the art of the djembe is designed to support and uplift the dancers. West African dance stimulates a sense of spiritual and community consciousness. Dance and drum connection can induce joy, stimulate moments of kinetic states of resilience and liberation. Jackson and I argue that African-American dancers, when we synchronize our movements to the drum, this constitutes a recovery of cultural transmission interrupted when African people were kidnapped and sold during the Atlantic slave trade. Regaining cultural fluency in West African dance is critical to cultural, emotional, and spiritual reparation. For example, Jackson's autobiographical journey, she articulates how she was attracted to the power of the drum and how it empowered she notes that it gave her courage and confidence and started her on a recovery process from the traumatic events of racism and internalized and institutional racism. Jackson and I describe how West African dance um, is a process, process of syncing up your heart and your body to the sonic vib vibration and the rhythm of the djembe. This process, we attest, can declutter, can purge, flush negative thought patterns and recalibrate a dancer's somatic experience with self-assurance. In another ethnographic um, project that I did, it was based in Guinea, West Africa. I explore the significance of the dance circle, the Fare Ra Langi. For West African dance, the study zeroed in on my observations of my teacher, Mustafa Bangora, in the circle and my personal experiences of interacting with Jimbe Fola, lead drummers in the circle. Observations of Bangora have taught me that professional Guinea dancers are ones who stabilize and enliven the music when they are in the circle. Here is a personal description of being in the circle. My kinesthetic in instincts and choices were informed by several elements. The movement vocabulary Bangora had taught us, the beats played by the djembe fola, my body intuition and memory, vocal affirmations from the crowd, and my ability to assess the compositional possibilities of the pocket or the groove of the music. Mutually, these parts galvanize the creative process. The communal spiritual ethos of the circle provided me with profound understandings of musicality and movement innovation. The circle is a critical pedagogical and choreographic space where dancers learn how to choreograph in relationship with the music and where they build their improvisational chops, where they practice musicality and acquire technique. A good movement technician in West African dance and for African diasporic dance in general, in a nutshell, is someone who dances with rhythmic virtuosity. The circle includes dance inducing djembe percussion and affirming community vibes. A dancer faces inward 
towards the musicians. The energy of the circle fine tunes a dancer's attention to music interaction and sharpens their understanding of movement, music, embodiment. In the circle, I have gotten to observe, absorb community support, love, and build my artistry. The circle remains a critical choreographic space in African diasporic dance. This is evidence um, when we think about how this format continues to evolve um, across time through the ring shout um, to the Afro-Brazilian, the Hora, um, to b-boy and house dance, um, the cipher remains a critical artistic space. Unfortunately, I've started to notice that West African dance um, and in the US, um, the dance circle is starting to be replaced with dancing in lines and learning choreography. This is getting overemphasized. Um, and I think that it's a reflection of how dance teaching formats and approaches are getting um, colonized um, and indigenous dance pedagogies are becoming um, and re or have remained endangered. And it's really time to, I think, um, uh, challenge that, that cycle. Um, and as, as future dance educators really embrace um, the leaning in, the open ear, um, and the acute um, observations of dance education um, that we see around the world. I'm gonna to start to conclude now. I want you to think about how these paradigms inform future directions in dance education. Collectively, the portraits from the, from the Pacific to America illustrate dance education mobilized by diaspora and indigenous communities. In these settings, the function of dance is held in high regard. While form, artistic practice, and performance is important, the desire to use dance as a world-making tool is of high priority. In Aotearoa, Guam, in the US, dance is about divesting oppression, unearthing culturally relevant dance content and initiating grassroots dance education and artistry. In Guinea, West Africa, I reported about the power of the circle for the circle format um, for nourishing dance artistry. The circle is where I have developed freestyle and, imp and improvisational skills that have also taught me to understand musicality from a West African perspective. This research reveals that sublime dance artistry can emerge when creative process is rooted in culture and community. My research takes stock of brown and black dance education, agendas, histories, content, terminology, and pedagogies. I specifically encourage dance educators, dance researchers to engage with indigenous and diasporic frameworks, to expand their engagements with different epistemologies, ontologies, and cosmologies of dance. These lenses help us to refresh and expand our theories and practices of dance education. I'm not saying that we um, disavow or turn away from the legacies and the lessons that we learn from dance education pioneers such as Margaret Dobler or Martha Hill or even Rudolf Laban. But we do need to provide dance education counterpoints that are not simply footnotes or tokens including indigenous diasporic stories and ways that create equitable encounters with dominant narratives is essential. This means that we need to become more cognizant of how dance education works around the world and its unique significance in ways that are relevant to our students, the wider community that includes black and indigenous people. This can help increase the breadth and depth of, of dance education 
in and out of school environments and season us with a world roundedness sense of dance. We need new or reconceptualized notions of dance that reckon with what McCarthy Brown asks, who are the owners of dance? And she signals the need to pay attention to whitewashing of dance teaching. She says critical race theory is an essential lens for addressing privilege in dance education. Kennedy also suggests that we need to be doing 1619ing of our American dance histories that dig into how the Atlantic slave trade play a role in the new meanings and formations of dance. Scholars such as McCarthy Brown, Kennedy, and Davis are reminding us that we need to do a better job with teacher training that challenges the logics, the paradigms, and the assumptions of dance education. As Charles Royal argues, expressions of indigeneity are not merely about colonial resistance not merely about decolonization, but instead challenge us to recenter, to reground, to reindigenize ourselves and our cultures that lead to positive change. Finally, I want to argue that this positive change is being brought about by dance education that reestablishes indigenous and diasporic pedagogies that are important to the making of healthy people and providing them with the spiritual capital to recruit vital ancestral literacies and sensory acuities. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Matthew Henley, and I am the Arnhold Associate Professor of Dance Education here at Teachers College, Columbia University. And it is my great pleasure um, to be joined by Dr. Cruz Banks for a question and answer session with some of our students. Hello. Hi. Hi so nice to see you. Likewise. Uh, thank you so much for your um, for your really powerful portraits of dance education around the world and your description of the ways in which pedagogy opens windows into different epistemologies, ontologies, and cosmologies. Um, it's just such powerful and important work. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure. Um, so we're, we're honored that you would uh, join us uh, here for the, the first uh, Arnold Symposium and, uh, and join us and answer some questions from some of our students. So I'm actually gonna get us started uh, by asking um, a question from one of our doctoral students who couldn't be here this evening, and that's Anna Fergoso. So her question actually begins with a statement and a, a quite powerful statement. So she says, I don't believe that racism can be reversed. In your talk, you mentioned that there are ways to recover cultural transmissions that were interrupted by various forms of colonialism. Can you give us some examples of how dance educators can create opportunities for cultural recovery? Yeah, I agree. I think that it's true racism cannot be reversed, um, but I do feel like cultural transmission can be recovered. And I think that there are examples of communities around the globe um, who are doing anti-racist, decolonial work um, through dance. Um, one example of this is African-American dance, for example, right? From the ring shout to hip hop culture um, is a product of this rehabilitation process. Um, dance has been used in black communities as a methodology for addressing racial trauma um, and speaking truth to power um, by protecting and celebrating black humanity. Um, many of the examples of dance educators doing this work happen on grassroots, informal, as well as um, in public school environments. Um, one um, example that I'll start with 
is um, the nonprofit organization called Africa International um, that was founded in Los Angeles, California by Dr. Jeanette Jackson, um, who um, um, created this, this um, nonprofit organization to set up um, dance education programs in her city. And her education um, uh, program specialized in West African dance. And the emphasis was around bringing West African dance to, um, to Black youth, to Black communities, um, as a, a way of addressing the miseducation of African Americans. Um, and also providing a practice, a cultural practice that increases the spiritual well being of African Americans. And she actually found her way into being an educator through really transformative experiences that she had as a teenager growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, and getting. Um, uh, the opportunity to study with what West African dance artists such as Yusuf Mbasa, Mustafa Bangora, um, Mari Bas, and the drum, the power of the drum really um, changed her sense of herself and helped her grapple with internalized racism. Um, another example that I want to bring to your attention is the Kaupapa Maori schools that are um, um, indigenous language immersion schools in New Zealand that are uh, that are um, operated by Maori communities, different tribes around um, the country, who use kapahaka, which um, basically means group dance, um, as a way to um, teach language to promote. Um, language in the, young, the younger communities. Um, think of dance as a database of indigenous knowledge because it involves art, music, and dance simultaneously. And so the, 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 the movement basically helps to um, strengthen the comprehension of the words that they're chanting. Um, so that's one example. Um, another example is um, a school that I have studied at um, in Guinea called Le Bagate um, that was founded by um, Mustafa Bangora who danced with Le Ballet Africans, which is one of Africa's most famous dance companies. Um, he established this school in the 90s, and not only does he um, invite um, international students to his schools, but he also um, invites local um, youth, um, aspiring dance artists to study when he is home, um, to give them an opportunity to study with, um, for example, um, such a master level dance choreographer and educator um, when a lot of these students in their formal schools do not get their cultural dance. So um, he's doing intervention work in terms of serving Black African-American communities when he's in the United States, but also when he's home. Uh, thank you so much for those uh, very powerful examples of cultural recovery that are going on in both large and small ways. It seems like there's a real opportunity for a lot of research to happen uh, to bring those stories uh, more to the fore. Um, thanks. Uh, I'd like to bring one of our students to the screen uh, with a question, and that is Joan Finkelstein. Good evening, Dr. Cruz Banks. It's such an honor to speak with you tonight. Uh, your work seems to me essential and moves me deeply on many levels. So my question is, how well equipped are American dance educators, most of whom, as you know, regardless of their cultural background, have been trained in Euro-Western theatrical dance forms and the thought traditions and constructivist practices of Dewey, Laban, and Dobler 
to incorporate African and indigenous pedagogies and worldviews? And what can they do to broaden their capacity? Thank you, John, for that question. Um, immediately, I would say that this is a challenge for dance education. Um, dance education is steeped in Eurocentrism um, and white supremacist um, theories and practices. Um, so the aspiration really does call for what Crystal Davis says, um, laying new ground, right? Um, it's about rethinking the biases in our content and pedagogy that privilege particular worldviews, epistemologies, aesthetics, and creative processes um, in dance. Um, I think in order to broaden dance educators' um, perspectives, I believe that it requires deep study in um, non-dominant dance styles, right? Um, and engaging in global viewpoints of dance that really help us understand cultural specificity. Um, one of the insights that I gained during my study um, with Mustafa Bangora at Le Bagate um, School of Dance and Drum in Conakry, Guinea, um, was um, from my experiences of being in the circle, the solo circle, the dance circle, um, which is um, normally a um, part of the West African dance format that it's at a dance class format that's at the end of the class, right? And um, dance students are given the opportunity to um, engage in an improvisational um, exchange with the music, the live music. And one of the things that I learned in that, in that deep study is that the movement mechanics will only get you so far, right? That in West African dance, you also have to have a musical intelligence. You have to understand how to dance in a way that makes good music right? That you go in with a, um, a commitment, just as the musician or the lead drummer um, plays the rhythm and has to hold that rhythm down while you're in the circle, you have to do the same by dancing in a way that is going to stabilize and heat up the music with dynamic rhythmic change. Yeah. And so this was a, you know, this was a decolonial epiphany for me because I realized that actually the moves will only get you to a certain point. You have to, you have to understand how those, those movement phrases that are taught by choreographers such as Mustafa Bangora, how they lay into the music, how they support the music. And this is one of the, you know, um, creative, philosophies of black African dance, which is to create rhythmic virtuosity. And a dancer cannot do that by themselves. They have to do it in relationship to a musician or to the, to the music, the electronic music or the pre-recorded music that they're listening to. Um, but in West Africa, the aesthetic is about that interaction with live music. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Our next student with a question is Zakia Atkinson. Good evening, Dr. Cruz Banks. It's a pleasure to have you with us and learn about your work and contributions. My question is, based on your experiences, how do dance artists and educators ensure that they are facilitating dance experiences in ways that are physically, culturally, and emotionally accessible to divergent and particularly marginalized groups? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zakia. That's a really important question. Um, the first thing that I would say 
is that dance educators have to um, bring a pedagogy of love, right? They have to teach um, with a genuine care for their students, for the emotional, spiritual, psychological journey that their students are on when they are studying dance or when they're in your classroom. Um, and that we also focus on pulling out the strengths of our students. Um, I would say that teaching culturally relevant, um, student-centered dance curriculums is part of this aspiration as well. Um, for example, there's a lot of brown and black um, folks out there who have not conceptualized themselves as dancers or dance artists um, because they didn't go to formal dance training, for example. Um, or they assume that they didn't study ballet or modern dance and so therefore they could never be a dancer or a dance educator. Um, um, but these are also students who um, often grow up with dance in their living room. They're taught dance from their grandmothers, their aunties, their uncles, their parents, their cousins, right? Um, and so one of the things that I've noticed oftentimes when I go into um, a classroom, I will say, you know, who has a dance background? And the only ones who tend to raise their hand are the students who um, have studio dance backgrounds. Um, and so it always gets me thinking, okay, let me back up. <laughs> okay, who likes to dance in the club? Who likes to dance with their cousins? Who made up dances when they were kids, you know? Um, so that we bring to the, the forefront the way in which dance is a part of the fabric of our life in many, in many cultures. Um, and that, um, yeah, and that there's different modes um, of dancing and different aesthetics and different creative processes um, that can actually um, occur within our own families. Um, one of the things that I want to um, um, think about is like how dance, how rhythm, how musicality gets passed on within black churches, for examples, within powwows, um, you know, uh, family barbecues, um, you know, the cultural sort of activities that we often do with, with our families that somehow doesn't get, um, you know, considered under the umbrella of dance, like I'm a dancer. Um, and I think that dance educators really do need to draw from the cultural and the ancestral funds of knowledge of our students. And that means that we have to ask questions, you know, dig in um, to some of the bio biographical information that helps us identify um, you know, where we can really help our students see um, the, um, the cultural knowledge that they come into the classroom with, right? And that, you know, that cha-cha or that electric slide that I did with my auntie matters. Um, and so I would start with that. Um, I think that, you know, so many of our students bring such rich um, uh, funds of knowledge from our families, from our communities, um, into our classrooms. And it's important that we acknowledge that and we capitalize on it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sakia. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cruz Banks. It's such a, an honor to have you uh, here sharing uh, time with our students. And I love that uh, you talked about aunties in your last uh, <laughs> answer because you and I actually share a sense of home because mm. we were both in Tucson 
for a long time. And I was just a baby when I was there. I don't think we crossed paths, but I have some very, very dear dance aunties uh, in Tucson, uh, whom I just love. Uh, and I think it, you know some of them as well. Yeah, any yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, you know, again, thank you so much uh, for the work that you're doing, um, bringing uh, these stories of indigenous and black and African-American and African pedagogies um, to the broader world of dance and dance education. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have you with us. Um, if anyone is interested in reading uh, more of Dr. Cruz Banks' work, you can find uh, citations for her publications in uh, the symposium program, which will be on the symposium website. Thanks so much. <laughs>